Hey everyone, Happy New Year. And in this video, I want to talk about the Grand Prix. Um, so it's a long overdue video because I've covered a lot of the a lot of variations in the Sicilian, but I haven't covered a lot of the anti-Sicilians. And so in this video, I want to start off with the Grand Prix, which starts after E4, C5, and the general idea is to play the move knight C3 and then follow it up after knight C6 or E6 or D6 is to follow up with the move F4. And now we can see that this is very uh, committal. First off, this weakens the diagonal towards the king, so this entire diagonal. But we can see that the bishop cannot actually occupy this diagonal. So maybe that's one of the reasons why this is kind of playable. And it comes with really aggressive intentions because it asks black a lot of problems or a lot of questions, uh, namely with this bishop on where it wants to go. Because if we play a system with e6 followed by d5, then our bishop on e7 isn't exactly happy. And so the most challenging system is to go for the g6 and bishop g7, after which this move g6 has kind of created a hook for this possibility of f4 to f5. So white is banking on this um, on these dynamics to justify the weakening of the king side. And in my opinion, this is an underrated opening, um, especially for uh, beginner and intermediate players, because a lot of people neglect studying the Grand Prix because they consider it as an inferior uh, option to the Open Sicilian, which objectively it is, and I'm gonna show you a few ways uh, to deal with it. Um, but you do need to know your stuff. So I do recommend you actually putting a lot of time and effort into studying the Grand Prix rather than just brushing it off aside as, a, as an inferior option to the Open Sicilian. Um, and yeah, there are many um, themes that we can look at that apply to many different variations. Um, and already, there's a decision to be made after the move knight c3 here. There are so many systems that we can go for. For example, g6, d6, e6, um, and even the move a6 are all playable. Um, but in this video, I decided to recommend the move knight c6, which is most principled. And you do need to know a few things against bishop b5, and also against the move g3, which I guess I'll cover those in another video. But in this video, we're, we're going to be focusing on the move f4, starting the Grand Prix. And after the move g6, preparing to occupy this diagonal with bishop g7, and we can see that there's a fight over control uh, over the d4 square. And so oftentimes, if black is able to clamp down on this square, then they're going to be quite comfortable. Um, and after knight f3, which makes most sense, bishop g7, uh, white has a couple of options. I want to discuss the move bishop e2 for a second here which is really rare and uh, quite strange because it puts the bishop uh, on an inactive square because once white plays the move d3, then the bishop is clearly inactive. But actually, instead of the move bishop b5 and bishop c4, which are oftentimes subject to um, the bishop being vulnerable uh, on these two squares, bishop e2 makes some sense to try to preserve the bishop. However, it's you know it's, it clearly cannot be a try for an advantage you know, with bishop e2. It's uh, just a move to get uh, bl the black player out of book. And so here I recommend playing the move d6 uh, with the simple plan of playing e6 and knight e7 uh, with a good position. And we can see that if we set up the pawns on e6 and put the knight on e7, we can control the f5 square uh, significantly and it's going to make uh, white's advance f5 uh, much more difficult. If we play a move like e6, this weakens a lot of the dark squares, and we should be very wary of this. White can immediately take advantage of the move th uh, with the move d4 here. And if we play the move knight takes d4, after knight takes d4, c takes d4, white has his move knight b5, uh, th threatening to infiltrate on d6 here. And if we play the move d6, then white can even play the move c3, um, you know, trying to sacrifice a pawn. Uh, and the point is that uh, the d6 pawn is just going to be a long-term weakness. So this is not exactly what we want. Instead, the move d6 is very natural. And even though this makes the advance e6 and d5, like for example, if we play e6, we're immediately threatening the move d5. But now since we play the move d6, then of course this e6 and d5 plan isn't as strong. But actually I've discovered through experience that this e6 and d5 isn't, isn't even what we want to go for. We actually just want to play uh, with this setup uh, with d6, with the pawns on d6, the pawns on e6, and then later going for a queenside expansion with this move work b8 and b5, b4, um, and trying to just play positionally um, instead of trying to break in, try to you know break through in the center. So yeah, this e6 and d5 plan isn't exactly effective 
um, and this E6 and D6 pawn center is very universal. So I recommend D6, and after castles, now we play E6, let's say pawn to D3, knight to E7, and Grand Prix players will, will typically play queen E1, preparing the moves queen, H, uh, queen H4, and after we castle, white wants to possibly play F5, and then open up this bishop's diagonal, you know, threatening bishop H6, trying to get the bishop into the game and exchange uh, one of the key defenders of black's king. Uh, and here we'll just castle. And the point is that if white plays an early queen h4, uh, this is very aggressive, but we can immediately take this thing out of it with the movement at d4. And now we're threatening to take the bishop and also we're attacking c2. So let's say white plays a move like bishop d1, trying to defend c2 here. Um, and there are many good moves here, but here I will recommend the move knight takes f3, just exchanging one of white's important attacking pieces. Because this knight on f3 often wants to go to g5, so we just remove that off the board. After rook takes f3, preparing rook h3. Now we can play knight c6, and we're threatening to, to exchange the queens here, after which we'll just be better in the end game because of our control over d4. Um, for example, queen takes d8, uh, rook takes d8, and black has many good ways to play here. Um, and the most active way to play is to try to, try to get in d5, to try to open up the center. Um, and if white ever plays e5, then we can oftentimes just try to break the center with f6. Very thematic idea. Um, we can also continue with rook b8 and b5, b4, you know, and we get a very good position here. Um, so instead, if they play a move like queen e1, which is very passive, then we can play this thematic move f5, now completely preventing white from playing f5. And now we can continue with our plan of rook b8, b5, and, you know, with domination over the d4 square, this is really um, good for black because they've, you know, white has spent like queen h4, queen e1, They've wasted too much time on these queen moves. Um, so instead of bishop d1, which is very passive, what if the immediate f5? A typical pawn sacrifice in the Grand Prix. Uh, but usually we have enough pieces covering the f5 squared. This shouldn't be a problem. But, you know, it's important to remember these kind of things because it can look scary if we uh, forget um, to calculate, uh, you know, the complications after f5. So here, e takes f5. Makes a lot of sense. But we'll also see a lot of times in this variation where we play g takes f5. Um, but instead, e takes f5 is very solid after bishop h6, which looks a bit scary, you know, trying to uh, play knight g5 next. Now we'll play knight ec6. And now again, we're threatening to exchange the queens. And if white plays knight g5, then we play f6. And it turns out that white's attack is completely uh, fizzling out because after, let's say, bishop g7, okay, fg5, we take the, take the knight. Queen h6, rook f7, defending against the threat um, and, uh, of the rook and also attacking the bishop. So bishop takes d4, knight takes d4, ef5, bishop f5, and black is clearly much better here because of, you know, the strong net on d4. Um, the king is very safe on g8, and next we can play queen e7, um, and black is already a pawn up, actually. So this is much better for black. So instead of that, knight takes d4 is the best move, but still... So after cd4, which is a useful, useful move to attack the knight, and, you know, we still want to keep our bishop um, defending our king side, so we play c takes d4. After knight d1, next we can just simply play bishop d7, very calmly play rook c8 next and attack the c2 pawn, and it's actually very difficult for white to create an attack. Um, for example, knight f2, trying to improve the knight. This has been played once before, um, but we can see that the knight doesn't exactly have a great future, unless maybe it tries to go to g4, um, and maybe, you know, h6 or f6. Um, but instead, after rook c8, attacking c2, this is critical. Bishop d1, and now f5. And we can see that knight g4 is, is prevented right now, and it's difficult to justify the knight being on f2, since it also um, cuts down the f-file. And so after bishop d2, just developing bishop f6, kicking the queen away, queen h3, and queen b6. This was played, uh, yeah, in the game before. And black has a lot of space here and can always defend with rook f7 if needed. Um, if And also if white chooses to play g4, um, then we can strike with e5 at the right moment. And we have enough support over the f5 square. So, yeah, this is very good. Um, black can also play on the queen side with the a5, e4, you know, trying to create some weaknesses on that side of the board. And black already has a nice advantage. Um, so that's just the general idea. And so this queen h4 is not really threatening. A more useful move is king h1 to try to be more patient and ask what black's next move is. But the thing is that this is not a very static position. Like, black has also a lot of their own play, like rook b8, and continuing with b5 next. Um, and the typical response to queen h4 in this line is to respond with knight d4. 
um, since there's pressure on c2, and then we can also bring the other knight to c6. So, yeah, besides, you know, having our own play, we can also stop white's counterplay with queen h4. Uh, so, for example, this, knight d4, neutralizes white's attack, knight takes d4, again, c takes d4. So now, not only, you know, with this with this capture do we get a tempo on the knight, but this also fixes the c2 pawn as weakness. So after knight d1, knight c6, threatening to take, to change the queens and enter a better endgame, so queen, queen g3 makes sense, but now b5. And, you know, with moves like a5 and bishop d7 next, and maybe even later rook c8 to put pressure on the c2 pawn, black is clearly not worse and is already actually better here. Um... This is also, it's also possible, possible to play f5 here, but I don't really see the need to play f5 right now if there is not a possibility of, you know, the knight coming to g4 uh, at this moment. So instead, b5 is very logical, you know, and just very straightforward play. Um, so, yeah, that's essentially this move, bishop e2, um, which I forgot to mention, but it's, uh, is an idea um, brought up by... Um, a lot of English players, and Simon Williams calls this the British Grand Prix. But I think that the pure British Grand Prix that he recommends um, starts out after e4, c5 is to play bishop e2 instead, uh, so that they can actually play c3 next, you know. Um, so keep idea flex ideas flexible of this knight, and maybe even play c3 and d4 instead of playing um, knight c3. Um, and so, yeah, we can actually cover that first, this bishop e2 move. And it, it, yeah, there are a lot of ways that the computer says are equal, but a very human way is to play is to move d5. Um, and this changes the character of the position a lot. Let's say if they play a move like d3, then after, okay, we can exchange the queens off and that would be okay, but I like to move knight c6 here. And if white continue with the f4, then we can play g6, and we just basically enter, um, yeah, the uh, typical Grand Prix, but with the bishop on e2. Let's say e6 here, but we see that, you know, we didn't even waste time with the move d6. Instead, we immediately strike in the center with d5. And it's hard to justify, again, this bishop being on e2. So let's say c3, uh, g7, queen e1, typical grand prix play. For castles, if white plays queen h4, let's say, we can play b6 and just finish development with uh, bishop b7. Um, even after e5, white is potentially uh, trying to gain a, gain a lot of space with d4. So we play d4 ourselves. And I think this position is very comfortable with bishop b7 next. And f5 is not really possible now since we can just simply take with the knight. So that's very comfortable. Instead, knight a3 has been played in the past. But, you know, we just play normal development b6 followed by bishop b7. Bishop a6 is also a nice move um, to try to put pressure on the d3 pawn. After e5, d4 is very nice um, to just prevent white from playing d4 and opening up this diagonal. So these positions are very nice for black. Let's say c4, we drop the bishop back to b7, and where exactly is white's attack, right? All of the pieces are behind their own pawns. Uh, for example, this bishop and this bishop. Also, this knight on c2 isn't exactly doing much. So yeah, in general, I like the uh, direction if white tries to um, you know, maintain a, a classical Grand Prix setup with d3. We can just play knight c6, g6, bishop e7, e6, knight g e7, and then just you know, play chess from there. Um, instead, e takes d5 is more critical, but after queen takes d5, hitting g2. Okay, let's see. If white plays the move bishop f3, which attacks the queen, this just misplaces the bishop, really, because the knight would have loved to be on f3. Um, and so we just play queen d7, and this is known as a temporary, like... Okay, this bishop on c8 is known as a temporary bad piece, because even though um, it's... It's not, you know, it's not possible to bring this bishop out now. The queen is actually developed, and later we can continue with like knight c6, bishop b6, bishop b7, where the bishop is much more useful on this diagonal. So even though it makes, you know, this bishop look kind of more passive, um, we can solve the problem uh, with no with no issues here. So instead, knight e2, okay, logical, um, you know, trying to get the trying to get the king to safety, but now we play knight c6, and we're already threatening knight e5. For example, if they castle, then we will simply play knight e5, and black wins the bishop pair, and white, and even though we're lagging in development, black will quickly play like e6, knight f6, bishop e7, um, and just get castled with no problems, while we're just going to win the bishop for no, you know, uh, and white does not have enough compensation. We're also nicely controlling the d4 square, so that's easy enough. Instead of they play g3, trying to drop the bishop back in response to knight e5, then we can just play g6, 
And now we can dominate the uh, d4 square. And positionally, this is already much better. Black can play knight h6 to f5 even to further control the d4 square. And if white is not breaking through with d4, then this is a very difficult position. Um, so instead of bishop f3, knight f3 makes more sense. Uh, we'll just continue with knight f6. Castles, knight c6. And at knight c3, we can simply drop the queen back to d8. And now, um, since we can develop our bishop, our light square bishop out to f5, there's no need for queen d7. So now we just restore, you know, the harmonious development, play bishop f5, e6, bishop e7, and this is no, you know, this uh, doesn't cause any problems at all. Um, one interesting line I've found is bishop e5, trying to uh, double the pawns, but we just play bishop d7 and d4. Uh, oops, not d3, very passive. So d4, which is quite frustrational, and this was tried once in 2019. Uh, by Sadwani, but um, it just leads to mass exchanges after knight d4, takes takes, queen takes d4, bishop takes b5, and we trade the queens off, knight takes b5, a6, kicking the knight back, knight c3, and e6. And here, um, this is a very easy game, you know, we just play bishop e7, and we can later look to improve the knight's position from f6 to d7, and plus potentially to b6 or c5, where, you know, from b6 you can jump to c4, or on c5 it can control the e4 square further and this game was really nice um by epishin um played in 2019 um yeah from an equal position he managed to outplay his opponent um said b3 has been also has also been played which solved the issue of this uh, dark third bishop um but now we just play a6 so a6 is useful but also counterintuitive because why would we waste the move with a6 now the idea is just to prevent bishop b5 and so it makes this bishop kind of bad in a sense, um, since it, you know, on, on c4, it is just blocked out with e6. And so it doesn't have the b5 squared trader off later. Um, and so after bishop b2, bishop f5, rookie one e6, this is the development scheme that we want to go for anyways. Um, white can try knight h4 to try to win the bishop pair, but after bishop g6, you know, taking on g6 would open up the h file, and otherwise we would just, just have a solid position. Bishop f3, okay, makes sense to try to double the pawns. So we'll just defend that with rook c8, knight g6, hg6, and g3. So th these are just some logical moves I've put on the board, uh, trying to demonstrate, you know, what play, how play could continue. And here, if, okay, we're not going to get an attack on the h file. So we'll just play bishop e7 and continue with castling knight e4, castles, and h4. This is a computer recommendation, but it's not really... Um, yeah, very challenging um, because, you know, this doesn't cause as many problems as h4 and many, many other lines. Uh, and here, maybe if you'd like to find a solution for black to try to untangle, you can pause the video. But a recommendation that I really like here is this move rook c7. And this move rook c7 is nice because it first off defends the b7 pawn. So it enables the knight to jump to d4 without hanging b7. And secondarily, it prepares the move rook d7 to put pressure on the d file. So this is a really nice move. And this position is balanced, but I really prefer black's position a lot. Um, you know, white is not breaking through uh, with an attack anytime soon. So that's just a general that's just a general idea of what can happen in this so-called British Grand Prix after bishop e2. Um, and yeah, actually, instead, uh, we can also look at the sideline after f4, uh, the McDonald attack. And... This is an inaccurate move order to enter the Grand Prix. And all you need to know is this move d5. And the the problem for for uh, for white is that this move has weakened the king's side too early before white has played knight c3 and prevented this d5 advance. So in this position, if white advances with the e5, then we can play knight c6. We're waiting for white to play the move knight f3 so that we can pin it with bishop g4. And get and get our bishop out of you know danger, and so for example knight f3 bishop g4 and oftentimes we can even exchange this bishop if it's provoked which let's say h3 bishop takes f3, and then playing uh, e6 followed by knight h6 to f5 and then we have a lot of control over the d4 square so this is very nice for black. Um, instead bishop b5 is the way to try to not allow this, and so we can here play just by bishop d7, and this. Okay, unbreaks the pin and also actually threatens this move knight takes e5. Um, for example, if you play like knight f3, knight takes e5 just unleashes an attack on this bishop, so it just wins a pawn. Um, so instead of that, bishop takes c6 makes sense. This has been played once before, 
and after bishop c6, d4, e6. And black gets typical play with knight h6 to f5, and can later support this knight with the move pawn to h5, so that g4 is prevented entirely. And so, despite having, you know, the two bishops um, in a French structure, you know, white has committed their pawn to f4 uh, too early, and so far has no development. So, yeah, black should be doing very, very well here. Instead of e5, e takes d5 um, has been played in the past, but now we will simply play knight f6. So we don't want to, uh, you know, allow knight c3 with tempo. So we want to take back here on d5 with the with the knight. And if we're able to do that, then we're simply going to be better because this f4 move is just, you know, completely weakening white's king side. Um, instead of bishop b5 is the main move, we play bishop d7 takes, and now queen takes d7 since we want to put pressure on the on the d5 pawn. And after, if the only way for white to try to justify this decision is to play the movement c4, you know, holding on to the pawn. However, this is really dubious because um, even though we're going to lose a pawn, long term we have, you know, better development and we have massive control over the d4 square. So after the move e6, black is already much better. Well, let's look at the example d6. And now this does force the queen off after queen e6, but look at this position after queen e2. Okay, white wants to exchange the queens and enter an endgame with a pawn up, but let's say queen takes e2, knight e2, and knight c6. And black just has domination over d4 and b4 squares. And with ideas of knight b4 even in the position, this is very difficult um, for, for white. Let's say castles, and we can even castle long. And white is unable to play the move pawn to d3 or pawn to d4. So, yeah, after, for example, a move like b3 trying to prepare bishop b2, we just play knight b4 and... We even have, you know, simple development with g6, bishop g7, uh, possibility of knight d3, and this is very, very miserable. Also, knight c2 is a direct threat. So, this is very good. Um, instead, if they play queen e2, not entering the endgame, you know, um, so so easily with, you know, black having lead in development and control over d4, this is possible, but now we play bishop d6. And this targets f4. And now, white's idea is to take on e6, and, you know, if we play queen takes e6, then we're going to get an inferior structure in the end game. So now we play f e6, and we just get this middle game position where we're just much better in development. We have control over d4, we have moves like knight e6, castles, and then bring the a rook to e8 so that we can eventually break in the center with e5. And for example, d3, castles, knight c3, knight c6, and, you know, knight d4 is already a threat. Rook a, e, rook a to e8 followed by e5 is also a threat. The white king is just stuck in the center. This is very dangerous. So yeah, that just covers the two big sidelines um, in the uh, on the second move, um, which I probably should have started with. But anyways, f4, g6, knight f3, bishop g7. And now there are two systems in the Grand Prix that white can choose, either putting the bishop on c4 or putting the bishop on b5. Now the downside of bishop c4 is that it's very vulnerable to e6 and d5, which we will often see. Um, but this makes more sense because it tries to target the f7 pawn. And I think this is a move that you really need to pay attention to. Because a lot of people will play this, and after the move e6, you know, trying to um, play knight g7 and f5, white will oftentimes you play this move f5, and this is the main move, trying to create an imbalance. Now, it's very critical that you remember uh, the theory here. But this is not a good move, actually. This main move, f5, is just not a good move. Um, we will cover that in a bit. But let's see what happens if white decides to castle. Which is logical, you know, castling quickly. But now we simply play knight g7. And since f5 is no longer possible, black is just ready to play d5 next. And let's say d3, d5. Oops, not d6. d5, we counter in the center. And taking on d5 here would just open, our, open up our bishop. So best is just to play bishop b3. But now we'll castle. And queen e1. This is, okay, again, very typical, you know, preparing queen h, queen h4. And there are many moves to try to, um, you know, fight for, um, uh, to keep the game going. And this is already, you know, already equal, theoretically. But what what should we play now? I like this move knight e5, actually, which, you know, knight d4 is also possible, trying to win the bishop on b3. But this does allow the move knight d4. Um, this is the main line, and probably best objectively, you know, leading to this, knight e2, d4, d4, and b5, 
followed by, um, you know, playing on the queen side, following a5, e4, bringing the knight to c6. Um, and if white ever plays e5, then we can always occupy the f5 square. This is very much playable and uh, a definite, yeah, definitely a possible option. But I also like the move knight a5, which puts the bishop pair without allowing knight takes d4. And let's say white, white just develops with bishop d2. We bring the other knight to c6. You know, there's no need to capture on b3 immediately. Uh, let's say rook d1. Now, okay, uh, we might as well take the bishop now. Knight takes b3, a, b3, and b6. Falling bishop b7 and, you know, bringing the knight to d4 uh, very soon. Black gets a very active position and white has no attack. So this is very comfortable. Instead of white plays the move e5, trying to close the center, f6 is very strong to just get counterplay against the center. And even though this does make the e6 pawn weak, uh, this bishop, you know, that typically puts pressure on the e6 pawn, no longer is, is going to be on the board. It's going to be just removed uh, very soon. Um, and yeah, we can just pick up the bishop pair whenever we want. And we can bring the knight to c6 to further put pressure on e5 and bring the bishop to d7 and just, you know, have a very nice position where white has no attack. And the psychological thing about the Grand Prix is that if white has no attack, they're just left with all of these weaknesses. So yeah, it's, it's a very double-edged opening. Um, but yeah, so castle is not very critical. White can play also e5 here. And th the thing is that against this e5 move, I really like the setup or, or the idea to challenge the center with the move d6. So if we play a move like d5, which is playable, but after bishop b5, I just don't like the passive, the passive bishop on g7. This is, you know, it's with a lot of pieces on the board, it's kind of hard to justify this bishop being stuck. Uh, behind you know behind the wall of uh, of white pawns but let's say if a lot of pieces pieces have been exchanged then i would far prefer that very that version compared to this version where a lot of pieces are on the board but either way that's just a tangent um d6 here is much more more logical to challenge the center and if okay if white takes on d6 then if a queen takes d6 white's impressive center is just gone now you know the e4 pawn is no longer there and we just have massive control over the d4 square. Let's say knight e4, um, attacking the c5 pawn with the queen. So queen e7, dropping the queen um, and preparing knight f6 next. So after castles, knight f6, d3, let's just say castles, c3. And black can just play b6 and bishop b7 and just have no issues at all. Like we can play queen c7 next to free up the e7 square for the knight to jump to f5. And, you know, just control the d4 square. Um, and this, you know, this weakness on d3 is actually a very, very significant one. It's something we can put pressure long term on. So, again, there's no more attack. And so we're just simply better here. Um, and that's if e takes d6. If white decides to castle and just sacrifice the pawn, saying, okay, you can take the pawn, but I'm going to try to get a lot of uh, counterplay, you know, with, with the time I've gained. It's best not to take the pawn and just develop with knight g7. And if they take on d6, now another resource we can think about is even knight f5. So that now we can take on d6 while gaining a tempo on the c4 bishop. And um, it just turns out to be really awkward. Um, and so black, you know, um, with, without white having a strong attack, black is just left with, uh, white is just left with all of these weaknesses. So instead knight e4 is critical, but now we'll take on d5, on e5. It's just, it's perfectly timed here. Knight takes e5, uh, hitting the c4 bishop, so takes, takes. And there is a threat of queen d4 right now. So it's not possible to play knight f6 because the bishop f6, a rook takes f6 and queen d4 check. Um, so d3 here, defending the bishop. And now, um, okay, the computer evaluates castles and f5, I think, pretty much equally. But this can get really dangerous if we don't deal with the possibility of, you know, uh, knight f6. So I do like the move f5. And with this move, black is doing very well. Um, there are concrete lines to know here uh, but they have never really occurred uh, in a game but I just want to mention to you like knight g5 is possible which makes sense to hit e6 but now we play queen d6 hitting h2 and also defending so knight f3 hitting the bishop bishop g7 queen e1 preparing queen h4 castles queen h4 and f4 I really like this move and it's this is really like very specific because f4 is not a move you see a lot um but the idea is just to shut down the king side with later playing h6 and g5. And white does not have enough counterplay for, for the sacrificed pawn. So this is very nice. 
instead of queen f3, this is the best, uh, this is the best move, uh, threatening, you know, to infiltrate on f7 if we take on e4. So now, so now I would like, to, I like the move knight c6. I think this is the simplest option. Just, you know, the, the knight has potential to go to e, to d4, and is one step closer to castling now. Um, so knight takes c5 is critical, obviously, just grabbing the pawn. And now queen d6, again, attacking h2, and also the knight. So now bishop e3. And now if you take the h2 pawn, you know, it kind of wastes a lot of time, because black still has the issue of this pawn on e6 being, uh, um, you know, a, a backward pawn, or uh, also, yeah, just a backward pawn, uh, with rookie 1 coming, potentially. So here I just like the move knight d4, trying to inf uh, infiltrate, or, sorry, in interfere with um, this bishop's defense over the knight. So now queen f2. Okay, so first off, obviously bishop d4 loses to bishop takes d4, so queen f2. And now queen takes e5 runs into c3, and so here we just simply castle. And black simply consolidates the extra pawn with no worries, since there's no more threat on f7, and black is already uh, doing very much fine here. Um, so I think this is the simplest option, and it's very forcing, but um, grabbing this pawn is definitely the best decision. You know, at some point, if white provokes us, we should be ready to take the pawn. Um, and yeah, that's the idea against e5. It's just to challenge the center with d6 and not play d5. Um, so instead f5, this is critical. And after g f5, so if you play e takes f5, this is really tough because after the white plays the move d3, the bishop's eyes opened, you know, white has control over the d5 square, and we really don't want to let this bishop um, be that powerful on this diagonal uh, by playing e takes f5. So instead g takes f5. And if they play e takes f5, then this allows to move d5. And this is very nice. And so it shows why this bishop is so, uh, on c4 is considered so um, misplaced oftentimes. Uh, after bishop b5, knight e7, this threatens knight takes f5. So what should probably take on e6, but now f e6. And this just keeps the center intact. And uh, okay, even though we have this bad bishop, our bad bishops, you know, there's a general motto that Bad bishops protect good pawns, and this pawn on e6 is just a very nice central pawn. Uh, at some point, we can even play e5 just to get rid of the, um, you know, I, a weak pawn. And after castles and castles, black is ready to play knight d4 next if allowed, and otherwise wants to just expand with e5. So white usually takes on c6 here to not allow knight d4 with tempo, but after bc6, this creates a further impressive pawn chain or pawn center. And after d3. Black plays e5, follows it up with queen d6, knight f5, and look at the bishop here um, and the impressive center that black has. And so this is a typical scenario where g takes f5 is very justified because even though it weakens our king side, white has no attack to justify um, this, yeah, giving up, um, yeah, giving black this impressive pawn center. So, yeah, um, it said e takes f5 is not the best, so d3 is probably better. Hoping that we take on e4 and just open up the d-file, you know, that would be very good for white with pressure down the d-file. And just a massive lead in development. So instead we play knight g7 and just finish castling. And now white has a couple of options. We can try to put pressure with bishop f4, after which I think we just break with d5. And it seems like after ed5 and ed5 that we have this broken, broken um, structure. But I think it's very comfortable, the fact that this bishop on b3 is just out of the game. After bishop b3 and bishop e6, the, the fact of the matter is that white does not have enough compensation for the, for the lost pawn, because white does not have an attack going on. Let's say queen d2 makes sense. a6, threatening c4 to actually trap the bishop, because after c4 takes takes, bishop a4, you know, we can play b5 and just trap the bishop. So here a3 is best, but now again we play c4. We shut down the bishop, bishop a2, and now even d4. And this is just an example of a forcing land that could occur, but it's really instructive. After knight e2, even this move c3 is nice. Uh, so now we're, pre we're preparing to exchange the bishops, uh, which is very strong. And we're also attacking the queen while we're at it. So now queen c1 is best. You know, if we, if you take on, b th on c3 here, that takes c3. I believe bishop a2, um, I believe actually bishop d4, or, yeah, there is a move here. Actually, queen e5 may just be winning on the spot. I'm not exactly sure, but, 
Knight b1, bishop a2. Yeah, something wins here, I believe. You knight b1, I guess you just give a give a check or something. I'll just check with the engine for a bit. Uh knight c3. Okay. Yeah, knight d4 immediately, I think is yeah, is winning. Um if you take, I guess queen takes d4 just wins the knight. And otherwise, uh bishop takes a2 is coming next. So yeah, either way, it's a very good position. So white is forced to play queen c1. After which we can take on b2. We can trade the bishops off, queen takes a2, and play knight d5. And white just you know, what is suffering with all of these dark script weaknesses? Let's say bishop g5. We just we can just play queen d7, defending this pawn. And all of these weaknesses are on the board. Black is up a pawn and white pieces are all uncoordinated. So that's just an, a sample line of what could happen after bishop f4. Uh, instead, bishop g5 is possible. Trying to pin the knight, preventing d5. Um, and this prepares e takes f5, since now we can't take back uh, with the knight. But now b6. And we're, we still don't care about e takes f5 because now we can play f6 and take back with the knight on f5. Let's say f e6. This is a possible um, sacrifice of the bishop. Since now if we take, then there's going to be a discovered check. So now d5. Very standard procedure. Bishop e3. And now if we take on g5, surprisingly, this is not best. After knight, knight takes g, uh, g5, let's say h6, knight f7. This gets a bit messy because the d5 pawn is actually under threat since we have to move this queen away right so instead c4 so yeah this move just secures the advantage it's important to get back the pawn this way without allowing d5 to be the weakness um after dc4 dc4 bishop c4 now we can take on g5 now g5 now trading off more pieces with queen d1 and now bishop d4 check first off closing down the d file this is very important king h1 we trade off more rooks play bishop takes c3 continuing to simplify 95 attacking the bishop after bishop b3 and bishop b7, clearly black's extra piece is much, um, you know, is much better than the three pawns because we have later control over the d-file. Um, the white king isn't exactly safe with this bishop just eyeing down this diagonal. So, yeah, black is much better in this in this uh, position. So, that's what could happen after fe6. Instead of bishop d2 just retreating, now knight takes f5. And simply domination over d4. We've seen this a million times before. Bishop b7 is coming and black is just much better. Um, so instead, queen d2 is better, not to take on f5, uh, preparing an attack with bishop h6. But now, after we play f6, just uh, stopping this pin, um, bishop h6 and fe4, now this is the right time to take, because the, the default pressure won't amount to much after black has castle. Um, let's say d d4, and now knight g6. And, okay, there are a lot of errors here, but the, the gist of it is that Black consolidates the position because they're able to stick a knight on e5. And they can also play queen e7 next to control the d6 square. Um, and with either b bishop b7 or bishop a6 next. So if white plays the move knight b5, then we can consider bishop a6 to try to exchange some more pieces. Um, and if, you know, if they don't play knight b5, then we can just continue with bishop b7 next. So yeah, black just gets an extra pawn and there is no attack. So it just fizzles out and black is much better. Not much to be said there. So this f5 move essentially is not very critical, and this entire bishop c4 move uh, is kind of inaccurate, objectively. But we can see that there are a lot of forcing lines that forces black to memorize, and so I do, again, emphasize the importance of actually studying the Grand Prix um, and not, you know, uh, casting it aside. And the next move is bishop b5. So this is the best move. It still maintains equality and has the threat of bishop to c6. Uh, so now playing the playing the move e6 is not desirable since after bishop c6, let's say bc6, white plays the move e5, and we can notice all of the dark square weaknesses, especially you know knight e4 coming to infiltrate the d6 pawn, and you know if we play d5, then it also take and look at these horrible uh, double double pawns on the c file for no compensation at all. Um, so instead we play knight d4 here, and with this move we're hitting the bishop on b5, and black has just just has ideas of playing a6. Uh, kicking the bishop away so oftentimes it's possible to get rid of this bishop um but often uh playing this move a6 is also very useful because we can gain a tempo on the bishop while preparing to expand with b5 and bishop b7 so in general you know taking this bishop is possible but a6 b5 is more useful let's say and white can white has a couple of moves they can play a4 here um trying to um maintain the bishop on b5 but we just play a6 you know bishop b bishop c4 um, 
I'm guessing d6 is very much fine here with e6 and g7. And I suspect that there are no issues for black here at all. Um, yeah, instead, um, knight takes d4 is a big line that we need to look at. And this move messes up white's development because we can take with c takes d4. And after knight e2, now there are many approaches in this position with, for example, queen b6 as well as a6 to try to, you know, break the pin. But here I would like to recommend the move knight f6. Now the point is that first off, d3, trying to defend the pawn on e4 doesn't work because of queen a5 check, winning the bishop. Um, and white's main move is e5. And the thing is that with this move e5, this hits the knight and this is the best move. But it overextends because this pawn on e5 can oftentimes be weak uh, because we can play the move d6 to undermine it. But concretely, it looks it makes a lot of sense. And I'm we're going to be looking at this move knight h5, which is very rare. But it has a very nice point to it, uh, which I, I believe that this is the best move and gives black an advantage. So it seems like g4 just wins a piece. Like, what is black doing, right? But this actually fails to an unusual sequence. First off, we play queen a5 which attacks the bishop, forces it to move back, and we also put pressure on the e5 pawn. Now, why is this important? Since now with bishop d3, we can sacrifice the knight when knight takes f4. This is very surprising, but it gives black a big advantage after knight takes f4. Queen takes e5, attacking the knight and giving a check, so knight e2 is forced. And now h5. Black just tries to open up the position. Now, if white decides to castle, then they're just walking right, in, right into an attack. We can just take on g4, g4, uh, threatening h2, so knight g3, and now f5. And look at black's, you know, black's pawn. They have three piece, three pawns for the piece, um, and has much more space. So not only are we, you know, um, okay, even though materially, uh, you know, white should be okay, but the quality of the pawns just make this position just unplayable for for white essentially white will black will simply play b6 and bishop b7 play e6 next to keep the pawn set to very solid and later can look to advance the pawns and even with the queen exchange for example white can play queen e2 now and the queen exchange would be fine because our pawns are just so dominating and it makes black's white's development so much diff so much more difficult uh, so this is very nice instead um g takes f h5 is possible but after rook takes h5 h2 is falling and you know we're gonna have three pawns uh, for the exchange, and the black and the white king is going to be exposed with our queen infiltrating the position. So this is not good. Said the best move according to the computer is g5, trying to close up the position before it's too late. But now this gives up the pawn this way, and after knight g3, trying to activate the knight by e4, we just get castled. And according to the computer, the best move is queen f3. Um, but now we just play d5 and look at the position. Like we're gonna come in with bishop g4. At some point we're gonna play e5, and we're just gonna take over the game completely while the white king is still unsafe. And notice how that typically if the bishop is on d3, it just prevents white's harmonious development since they're not able to push the d pawn forward and get this bishop out in the, into the game. So a sample line here uh, is bishop e2, bishop g4 getting a tempo, queen g2. We can take on e2. Forcing queen takes e2, rook a c8, hitting the c2 pawn, forcing d3, and now our, our queen is being hit, so we drop back to f6, uh, rook f1, trying to get a tempo, but now we play queen d6. And long term, with, with the rooks doubling up on the c file, putting pressure on c2, this is just very difficult to defend. Uh, at some point, we can also play e5 to uh, can take control over the center. So this is just a winning advantage. Like, it's just long term, but it's completely winning. So... Yeah, we can go back here instead of um, instead of this move, bishop d3. White can also play a4 here, but we can play a6. Um, and if the point is if bishop c4 comes back, then again knight takes f4 with the same idea, with similar compensation. Uh, instead of bishop d3, again knight takes f4, same compensation. Uh, and if rook a3, which is recommended by the computer, um, pointing out that a takes b5 loses to a takes b5, since the rook is not defended on the a file, we can now play queen c7, and we still are putting pressure on the on the e5 pawn and the f4 pawn. So now after bishop d3 again, um, knight takes f4 is next. So yeah, we'll get very similar compensation again. So this entire idea of knight takes f4 is very strong and very concrete. Uh, if they take on d4 now, then after queen b6, we, we're hitting the two pieces. So this forces c3. Um, 
And then after which knight takes f4 will just destroy white center and just expose the, the king completely. So that's not good. Um, instead, they can castle as well. Uh, but this enters really this weakened diagonal. So we can play queen b6 here, hitting the bishop and threatening a d3 check. So bishop d3 is the only move. And now d6. And so this is what I wanted to point out. The weakness of the um, of this e5 advance is that it can be undermined with d6. And additionally, we're also preventing g4 since now our bishop's eye is opened. So let's say e takes d6, queen d6, and black is clearly much better. They can play castles, they can play bishop g4, and the nice thing about playing the putting the bishop on g4 is that it puts more pressure on white's position, makes the knight any, unable to move, and also discourages h3, since now our knight on h5 actually just allows for this resource of knight g3. So this knight on h5 has really a lot of purposes, and as long as the critical, you know, g4 move doesn't work for white, this knight on h5 is beautifully placed. Like, it prevents h3 because of knight g3, as I said, and it would just, like, takes over a lot of the dark squares. So, that's possible. And best move is here is probably c3, and this is the only move uh, to still kind of maintain equality. But I do like black's position after a6, first off. Kicking the bishop back, very, very typical. If bishop d3 comes, then we can play d6. And this is very nice, because after c4, we can take on e5, and this forces fe5, because d5 just loses the bishop. So fe5, and now instead of taking on e5 here, immediately we can play bishop g4. Threatening the move knight f4, uh, introducing this very nasty pin. And we can simply play bishop takes e2 and queen takes d4 next. Uh, and white center is just falling apart, as we, as we see. So instead of bishop c4, now we can play the thematic move d5. And if they play bishop b3, let's say, then we can play d3 followed by knight takes f4 uh, with a big advantage because we're destroying the king side. Um, instead, if uh, e takes d6, then now I like this move castling a lot. So the point is that we want to take on d6, but if you play queen takes d6 now, an additional option is this move queen e4 and, okay, queen b4. And it's like, why would you give white this option if you could avoid it in the first place? So castles. And now taking on e7 is just horrible, since this wastes too much time. Let's say, you know, if you take on d4, then after bishop, uh, bishop takes d4, black, white is not castling anytime soon. Let's say d3, rook e8, with bishop g4 coming, this is too much pressure. Um, so instead, if castles now, then we can play queen c5. And notice how our queen developed to e7, and now to c5. And now there's no good way to deal with the uh, threat of d3 check. Let's say b3. It's possible to, to play d3 now and just win the piece, but b5 is even stronger since we have the threat of d takes d3 followed by c2, um, just attacking the rook in the corner. And this bishop is being attacked right now. This is, you know, we're just winning easily. Um, so, yeah, um, set so castles, queen c5 is winning. So instead of taking the pawn, castles is possible and the queen takes d6. And now again, bishop g4 is coming. This is very nice. Um, and the knight is very useful again on h5, preventing h3. Um, and in general, you know, this is a very good position. C takes d4, uh, you know, knight takes d4 is not even possible because the bishop on c4 is so loose. So this is very difficult for white to continue development. Um, so the best move here is bishop d3, the only move to maintain equality. And now we will reach a very picturesque position after castles. Since we, this gets the king to safety and is very important to prevent any, you know, possible queen and four checks as we saw before. And if white decides to castle, which is probably best, um, white can try to fight for equality here. But in general, after f6, um, black is getting a lot of counterplay against the center. Uh, the only, the best move here is apparently to move e6, but after which f5. And we'll take on e6 next, and um, there are going to be more details in the uh, study link that I post below. But... Essentially, we can see that black is doing very well in such a position. Um, and so instead of that, c takes d4. This is the position that I want to show because it's very picturesque. White has a beautiful center, but this position is very concrete. And black can break through with f6 here. Now, if white takes on f6, then after rook takes f6, f4 is going to be weak. And let's say castles, then now bishop g4. Again, very thematic, putting pressure here. After g3, defending the pawn, queen d7. And we're simply going to double up the rooks on the f on the f file and break through with g5. And this is going to be too much for white to handle. Um, and notice also that actually this knight on e2 isn't even defending the d4 pawn. 
um, because it's being pinned right now. So any tactics on the long diagonal, I think work. For example, I, I remember seeing this move before recommended, but rook takes f4. gf4, bishop takes d4. It just wins the rook. And wins the pawn and exposes the king completely. So just an example of a tactic that's possible. Uh, instead of g3 here, uh, defending this, uh, this, you know, this, this chain. But now again, bishop g4. Now taking advantage of the light squares. Queen b3 is possible. And now they're attacking b7, so we just defend it. And again, we can simply play rook d8, trying to, um, you know, sustain the pawn d5. Play king h8 next, uh, just to secure the king from the diagonal. And go for g5. And white is basically busted here because of their inability to develop, especially this bishop on c1. You know, unable to connect the rooks. This is very difficult. Uh, instead, queen b3 is, has also been played once. But now I like this move bishop e4. Again, increasing the potency of f takes e5. And if white plays g3. Okay, we play queen d7. Typical to defend the pawn. And now here castles. And now we take on e5. Now f e5 is not possible because this exposes the white king too much. We just bring the rooks in with e6 and queen f7 next. This is winning easily. Uh, instead of d5, which is force, we now play g5. And this... White is simply helpless against g takes f4. And as we saw before, if white takes on g5, then their king is going to be too exposed. So that again is not possible. Best here is the castle. And now d5, this is this opens up the center after d5. Now again g5, undermining the entire center. And black is much better here. Um, there is no good response. Like I can't find a find a good move for white here, uh, honestly. Um, so fg5 looks natural enough, but again. Okay, like, besides taking on f1, which is probably good enough, queen a5 is actually best, because there is a simple and primitive threat of queen c5 check. Uh, and white is not able to deal with it. I think the computer recommends rook f3, which, obviously, something has gone very wrong if queen f3 is recommended. Um, but yeah, queen c5 is not, it's like, impossible to stop. Um, let's say queen c3, trying to um, trade off the queens and cover the, the, the c5 square, but now queen b6 check. And if queen d4, bishop takes d2 is a nice queen sacrifice to end the game since f1 is being threatened with mate. So that's just a nice sequence to demonstrate the power of this variation. So yeah, I think I've covered uh, bishop d3 and bishop c4, um, d5, bishop d3. Yeah, I've covered all of this. So essentially, it cover we cover this move knight takes d4, which is a sideline but it's very important that you know you know the typical ideas um and you know um really try to mem not even just memorize it but also understand the dynamics of such a crazy position um and the next move is the main move castling and here there are three ways to actually deal with this move first off we can the first option is to take the bishop on b5 uh just removing the uh, bishop pair after knight takes b5 challenge the center with d5 and if white plays e takes d5, then simply after a6, kicking the knight back on c3. Okay, first off, again, we cannot take on d5 since knight c7 is a fork. So a6, and then knight f6. And we're just going to collect the d5 pawn with the knight. And white has simply just weakened their king position for no good reason. They have no attack. So this is just good for black. Um, the thing is that white has to move e5. And if we play a6, which is solid, okay, d4 is possible and leads to sharper play. Uh, but a6 is more solid, knight c3, bishop g4, uh, d4, cd4, queen d4. Now we remove the bishop, the, the knight here. Um, since that's kind of the main idea of bishop g4, we play e6. And this is just an equal position um, with ha you know having exchanged so many pieces. So this is possible. This is the first line that is you know equal objectively, but not very inspiring as we see. a6 is another idea. It's a more solid and standardized approach. I think this is the most popular. After bishop d3, um, we can play the move d6, which just opens up the lights for a bishop, preparing bishop g4. So white typically takes on d4, allowing c takes d4, knight e2, and then knight f6, just counterattacking e4. And white typically plays c3, you know, we take on c3 here. And dc3 and bc3 are both possible, but let's look at the main move dc3. After castles, king h1, trying to get out of the diagonal. We play b5, knight g3, bishop e7. White can try to play f5, but... There's no worries at all since we'll just play a5 followed by b4, a typical minority attack in, you know, a, such a close Sicilian uh, position. And black has a strong desperate bishop across the diagonal, and white isn't exactly breaking through with the attack. 
So this is fine. This is just okay. Um, and there are more details in the study, obviously, that you can check out. Um, but I did. I do remember um, this game that was played, I believe, two years ago. Um, this idea first implemented by Prognananda, this move F5. And this really inspired me because this is an ultra rare move. In the Leeches database above, you know, in the Masters, you know, among these strong players, F5 has only been played once. In the Masters database, according to Leeches, it's, it's again only been played once and this is a very underrated idea actually so most grand prix players will not be expecting this and they will most likely not have studied this and the thing is that this move is just equalizing like there is no there's no downside to this move necessarily like objectively and just concretely there's no downside of it um first off knight takes d4 this is very bad because of cd4 knight comes back to e2 and the queen b6 and there's no way to deal, there's no good way to deal with d3 check. Bishop d3, and look at how f5 is so useful. We take on e4, give a discover check, and we just win. So when I take d4 is not possible. Instead of white plays d3, we can look at what happens if white does not play e5. If white does not close the center, what happens? So now we play a6. Typical move, kicking the bishop away. Bishop c4. And now we close this bishop's diagonal with e6. And what are we trying to do here? If white does not close the center, we can continue with the typical plan of knight e7, knight c6, um, and at some point, white is probably going to have to play e5. Uh, let's say, for example, a4, knight e7, um, and we'll just play, we'll just treat the position in a similar way um, to the main line after e5, just without this inclusion of, you know, uh, e5 and d6. Um, because in the main line after e5, this is the best move, removing the tension, but now we play a6. And the best move here in the position is probably bishop c4. Um, so now, um, if we play the move d6, then yeah, I think that um, this bishop kind of like roams free. So now we first play e6. So the idea is to block the bishop diagonal, and we're also threatening the move b5 to try to gain a tempo against the bishop. Um, and white's best move is to play a4 here preventing the b5 advance and it's also a very thematic move that once black has played the move a6 white can try to play a5 to gain control over the b6 square so maybe knight a4 to b6 is an idea um but you know we don't have any problems here once we challenge the center with d6 and this is very nice because it gains a lot of counterplay against the center um and white can play a5 just to play positionally ignoring the threat or they can play e takes d6. Now let's look at a5 first. Uh, this would this would seem a bit annoying because you know what is just ignoring the um, ignoring this uh, our, our pressure on the center. And it's very con it's very important here to know the concrete move d5. If we take on f3 and we grab the pawn here, this leads to a very tough position because. After, even if we, okay, let's, okay, they're probably not going to take on e5. They're just going to play d3 here and prevent our e-pawn from advancing. And we're just left with weaknesses on the e-file later. Let's say knight f6, rook e1, castles, h3, preventing knight g4. We can take here, but clearly white has a lot of compensation for the pawn. Uh, active queen, control over e5, backward e6 pawn. This is good for, good for white. So instead, d5 is best here. And the bishop should retreat back to e2. And now knight e7. So this allows knight takes d4, cd4, um, but the thing is that the knight cannot retreat back to e2. So knight e4 is probably best, and this will lead to very interesting complications after queen takes a5, pawn to b4. So now the idea is after we grab the pawn, white plays c3 and tries to gain, uh, you know, control over the center. Um, after queen a5, white can play queen b3, b5, uh, kicking the knight away, knight c5, and now, okay, taking on, on a1, we just land with bishop b2, or bishop a3, actually, we just trap the queen. So instead, queen b6, hitting the knight, cd4, and there is a threat of bishop takes b5, making use of this pin. So rook b8 here, securing the rook. After bishop b2 and castles, we reach a very unclear but interesting position where no side is better, per se, but it's very interesting because black has two connected pass pawns on the, on the queen side here. Um, but these pawns are potentially... Uh, could be weak and so I think more investigation needs to be um, done here 
but it's very interesting what can happen in this kind of position. And if I find more details on this variation, then I will add them to the study. But essentially, the most natural move here is just to take on d6. And there are two moves here. Uh, queen takes d6 is possible. And I do, uh, uh, that's going to be my main recommendation. Instead, b6 is also possible to prevent the advance of a5. Um, but there's a specific line here that I don't like, so I'm not going to be recommending this. Um, instead, queen takes d6 is uh, better, uh, just to, uh, you know, obviously just develop the queen, preparing knight e7 to c6 next, and this will give black a very comfortable game. Um, in the game that Tari played, Ariantari, um, against Park Nananda in 2021, he played this move d3, and now we'll play knight e7, preparing knight c6 to reinforce control with the d4 square. And knight e5 was played in the game. But surprisingly, this move, you know, it doesn't look too bad. But the knight um, is actually not doing a lot. Because it doesn't even allow, you know, f3 is still controlled by r knight. So white isn't, white isn't exactly allowing for, you know, the use of the f3 square by a queen or by a rook. So black, I think, can get very comfortable game with b6 here. Um, in the game, knight ec6 was played, uh, which is also okay. But after knight c6, knight c6... One less piece that controls the d4 square or could occupy the d4 square has been uh, removed off the board. So after, let's say, a5, castles, bishop e3, the move playing the game is bishop d4. An improvement is possibly bishop d7, uh, let's say queen d2 and knight d4, rerouting the knight to d5, and this just gives an e you know, equality. And quite a nice game, actually. But instead of knight ec6, the best move here is b6. Now, this move prevents the a5 advance, uh, and it's even better now because um, white does not have access to queen f3. Because actually in the line before, um, in the b6 line, this actually allowed a variation that I didn't like, which involved knight takes d4, bishop d4, king h1, queen takes d6, queen f3. And this move is kind of what I didn't want to allow. The point is after rook a7, um, white passes move a5, b5, and then sacrificing the bishop and getting this interesting imbalance. And this is, you know, very interesting, but it's kind of difficult for me to justify uh, this imbalance since white is going to have um, a lot of nice pass pawns on the, or a lot of nice pawns on this, uh, on the queen side of the board. So it's just going to be a defensive task for, for black. So instead, queen takes d6, d3, knight e7, knight e5, and now b6. Since now, you know, queen of, the idea of queen f3 is not possible. And... The thing is that we want to play bishop e7, and if later the knight or d4 is threatened with a move like bishop e3 or knight e2, then we will retreat this knight back to, d to c6, since we don't want to allow black's, uh, white's bad knight on c3 to be exchanged with our good knight on d4. We want to remove this knight, which is quite strongly placed on e5. So, let's say knight e2, um, and okay, the d4 outpost must be maintained by black, so we don't want to exchange this, this knight. We exchange one, we instead want to exchange this knight on e5. Um, and after knight f3 back, castles, black is simply ready with bishop e7, rook a to e8 to reinforce the e pawn. Um, or rather, I think, I believe actually rook a d8 is better to try to control the d4 square. Um, and we have ideas of knight d5 as well. Uh, and it, eventually we can try to expand it in the queen side with b5. Um, white's pieces are kind of just like stepping on each other's toes. It's really. You know, this bishop is not doing a lot. This pawn on f4 controls e5, but we also have massive control over e5. We can also look in the future to advance with e5. So a sample line goes bishop e3, bishop e7, c3, trying to advance with d4, and now rook e8. So this kind of discourages d4 because black has a lot of control over the d5 square and can use this square for the knight. For example, if white plays d4 now, we can even play knight a5, kicking the bishop away, and bishop a2, c4 and we're simply going to play b5 next and um shut this bishop out for good and this is going to give black a very nice position um we have also the idea of bishop takes f3 and then later putting the knight on d5 so that we remove our bishop that's going to be blocked anyways once we play knight d5 and then we can stick on d5 with advantage so instead of that bishop b3 is also possible but we go with the same idea c4 bishop comes back to c3 c2 and now we, we give up the bishop so that now we gain access to the d5 square. And next, we want to try to advance with b5, but our knight on a5 is kind of hanging. So we simply play rook e8 and advance with b5 next. And black is already doing much better here. 
uh, and give claim an advantage with um, better pieces. Like, look at these bishops. They're quite, quite bad. Um, instead, rook b1 is possibly better, uh, recommended by the computer, preparing b4. Um, but now we play knight d5, attacking the bishop, bishop f2. And okay, taking on f4 is kind of risky um, since we're wasting a lot of time there. And also e6 is also weak. So knight a5 here is a very thematic move. Threatening to win the bishop and um, forcing it to move back. So now bishop a2. And we can play b5 here and just, you know, be happy with the space that we got. But I like this move knight c7 a lot because it has, it has three points to it. First off, it defends e6 nicely. Secondly, it opens up the possibility of bishop takes f3. And third, it attacks the, d3, the d3 pawn. And so this is very difficult to deal with. White is forced to find the move knight e1, defending this pawn and removing the knight from, you know, from danger. And now bishop d5. So we see that we're trying to exchange the good bishop that um, that white has. And also by removing the light squared bishop, white is going to have less defenders of the d3 pawn since it's on a light square. So now after bishop d5, knight d5, black just has harmonious peace development. For example, knight f3 back, h6, prevents any knight g5 jumps, and we just want to play rook f to e8, bring the knight back to c6, and advance with e5 to open up the position. And I think black is already much, um, you know, to be preferred here. So, yeah, essentially that covers this, um, this idea after knight e5. Instead, if white plays a bit better here with a5, I think that black just played knight ec6 and just gets a very nice game because they're preventing knight e5, they have control over the position, they can castle and then, you know, bring the king to h8 and eventually look to advance with e5. I think this is very nice. Um, and overall, this recommendation of f5 is very, is very fresh um, and I think something that a lot of players will be surprised uh, to face. So, yeah, this is an exceptionally long video, but I hope, yeah, you also pay... Um, you know, the Grand Prix, the respect that it deserves and, um, you know, don't underestimate it because it is very dangerous if you don't know, don't know the concrete lines. So uh, thanks so much for watching. Uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.